Hello, everyone. Welcome back, all of you, to the fifth roundtable on air pollution organized by Air Quality Asia and Observer Research Foundation. I'm Aparna Roy. I lead the Climate and Energy Program at ORF Center for New Economic Diplomacy. So far, we have had enriching, fascinating, and exciting round of conversation. The key aspect that all the roundtables unanimously recognize is the grave multifaceted risk that air pollution poses to India's development future, and that necessitates stringent measures to mitigate the crisis. One of the most important ways to combat this menace is, of course, to shift towards cleaner sources of energy while moving away from heavily polluting fossil fuel as coal, diesel, etc. ORF and AQA is honored and delighted to be joined by India's largest independent power producer of renewable energy, Renew Power's founder and chairman and managing director, Soman Sinha, to deliver his keynote address at this important convening. Let me briefly introduce Mr. Sinha. Uh, Soman Sinha is the chairman and CEO of Renew Power, as I said, one of India's leading clean energy companies uh, with an aggregate portfolio of over 10 gigawatts spread across 110 plus sites. Suman is the co-chair of Electricity Conveners Group and member of the Stewardship Board on Shaping the Future of Energy, an alliance of CEOs, climate leaders at the World Economic Forum. He serves on the board of directors of the US-India Strategic Partnership Forum. He's a member of the board of trustees for the Climate Change Organization and chairs the India Advisory Group, the Climate Group. Sumant has also been instrumental in Renew joining as founding member of the First Movers Coalition. Uh, for those who don't know First Movers Coalition, it's a public-private partnership between the U.S. State Department through Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Herry, and the World Economic Forum. Sumant has been recognized as an SDG pioneer by the United Nations Global Compact in 2021, and very recently, he was also recognized as the trailblazer of the year 2021 by the SNP Global Plan. Mr. Sinha has previously worked as an investment banker with Citicorp and ING Barrons in the US and UK, and as CFO of the Aditya Birla Group and CEO at Sutlon. Suman has a master's degree in international affairs from Columbia University and a diploma in business management from IIM Calcutta and a BTEC from IIT Delhi. Uh, Mr. Sinha, I now hand over to you to deliver your keynote address. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Parna. Thank you so much to ORF uh, and High Quality Asia for inviting me to deliver this uh, keynote. Um, you know, you guys run a very, very important uh, conference on a very critical topic um, for all of us who um, live in certain parts of India, especially Northern India. Uh, we all suffer from the consequences of uh, pollution very, very substantially. Uh, and um, there have been multiple studies that have shown how much um, the impact of this pollution is in terms of uh, productivity loss, in terms of extra healthcare costs, and most importantly, in terms of lower standards of living and also uh, shortened lifespans. So uh, pollution, uh, air pollution is an extremely, extremely critical topic for all of us on a personal basis as well. And of course, uh, extending uh, uh, the whole issue of um, air quality also to include carbon emissions, which of course it does, uh, there is a much bigger global challenge, which is the issue of climate change itself that is also caused by uh, poor air quality. Um, and so therefore, this is a very uh, important conference and I'm really glad that you all are getting together, convening this group and discussing this uh, important topic. And I do hope that um, from this, there is a, a meaningful interaction that you have with policymakers because ultimately, it has to get to the policymakers for them to take action um, for it to result in uh, an improvement in our uh, living standards and so on. So I do hope that there is that engagement also eventually uh, with policymakers. But as I said earlier, incredibly important to have uh, convenings of this nature. And I'm glad that uh, uh, ORF is uh, certainly taking the lead on this. So, so kudos to all of you for that. Now, coming to the topic, um, uh, and uh, the role of clean energy in addressing this issue of climate change and air quality in general. Uh, you know, we all know that uh, uh, fundamentally underlying uh, a lot of the air quality issues is the issue of burning. Uh, it is the issue of burning uh, to generate energy. 
Um, and actually, if you look at it, almost all energy is generated, or at least the bulk of it by va- large um, proportion is generated by burning something, whether it's burning oil or coal or um, wood, uh, you know, whatever it might be. But fundamentally, the way humanity has evolved has been that we generate uh, energy, which we need for so many of our activities by burning something. And that burning something, unfortunately, results in the emissions of carbon dioxide because all the things that we burn uh, have carbon as the basic uh, material. And therefore, the burning of that carbon leads to carbon dioxide because it obviously combines with the oxygen in the atmosphere and creates that carbon dioxide. But it also creates carbon monoxide, which is also very damaging. And of course, as we burn things, things don't just contain carbon, they contain a lot of other things as well. And that leads to the generation of other uh, very dangerous uh, gases like uh, nitrous oxides or, or uh, sulfur uh, uh, you know, oxides or dioxide, etc., all of which have their own very negative impact uh, on air quality and on pollution in general. Um, so, and of course, we also know that there is some part of air pollution that comes from dust, that comes from construction and so on. But those are, I'm not going to deal with those aspects. I'm going to deal really with the aspects of energy generation, uh, because that is really the sector that I come from uh, and that we're addressing. Um, and so the question is, can we, uh, as we look at our energy consumption, and you know, I'm sure you've discussed this, but just to uh, recapitulate for everybody, uh, energy, essentially, we tend to believe that a lot of the energy consumption happens through, uh, you know, for electricity generation, but actually electricity generation accounts for only about a quarter of total energy consumption. Uh, the balance three quarters of energy consumption comes from mobility, which is again, not only cars, cars, of course, are an important aspect of it, but it also comes from shipping from the maritime sector uh, and also from aviation. So, and those are almost equally contributing to the overall emissions from the mobility sector. Uh, and so, of course, we need to address the, the problem of uh, uh, electric vehicle, I mean, vehicles to electric vehicles, but we also need to eventually have solutions found for maritime and for um, the uh, civil aviation side. Um, then uh, there is another very large chunk of energy that is used in corporates, uh, industries, uh, for, gen- you know, for building things or producing things. And that's a pretty large amount as well. And there, of course, industries uh, have to heat things you know, like metals and so on, or, or for making cement. And that heating also ultimately comes from burning something. And again, we come back to the issue of uh, fossil fuels. Um, and then the third, the last quarter really comes from uh, buildings and, and a bunch of other areas. So when you look at the problem, uh, it's we actually have to tackle all of these, in some ways, four different segments. And um, uh, otherwise, we're not going to be able to solve the problem. But of course, we have to uh, break the problem down into, into bite-sized areas so that we can fundamentally then find solutions to all of those. Um, And when you look at it, um, today, uh, of course, we get energy from us from a supply standpoint, uh, mostly from fossil fuels, but there are also other areas like hydro and nuclear. Unfortunately, those are relatively small. Uh, Hydro and nuclear collectively, I don't think would account for more than five to 10% at max of total energy generation globally. Uh, The bulk of it really comes from oil and coal, unfortunately. And both of those are highly carbon uh, and other uh, noxious uh, pollutants uh, emitting. And so therefore, the fundamental problem is that we have to stop this burning. And the question is, how do we do that? Uh, And, and, you know, up till now, there has not really been a solution that had become available. But I think over the last 10 years, you know, various new things have emerged. Uh, But behind those new things, I think the fundamental um, factors that are going to make change happen in the future, actually there are three fundamental factors that I would point to. The first fundamental factor is a realization. The realization is that we cannot any longer keep burning things to produce energy. That has to change. Clearly it's being driven by the climate change problem Uh, not by the pollution problem per se, but by the climate change problem. But stopping the burning will also address the pollution problem in large measure. 
and so therefore that is that realization in civil society and in uh, and in nations at large i think is getting to now a point where at least to my mind we've crossed a tipping point and this has now become a very much bigger uh, source of conversation the second fundamental uh, fact that has happened is that technology has evolved rapidly and in that evolution of that technology we are now finding solutions that are available which are commercially viable solutions and those really therefore can be the bedrock of finding this solution to this burning problem and the third part of it is that now there are business models that are becoming available that make it viable from a commercial standpoint for large amounts of capital to come into the sector and essentially for people therefore to come in and lend their entrepreneurial energy people like me etc to actually you know both solve the problem and in doing so also generate returns for capital providers and so i think these three fundamental things that have happened uh, or in fact are happening even as we speak are the i think the the, the fundamental elements around which this problem is going to be solved and so let me take uh, not the first problem because we know all know the, all the global multilateral conversations and societal issues that are going on so i'm not going to talk about that i will talk about the second and third aspect the second is the issue of technology now if you think about it within that there are two fundamental things that are happening as a result of the evolution of technology number one is that in the electricity quarter of this energy consumption uh, pie we are now finding that uh we are able to generate uh, energy through renewable energy sources which are clean don't emit carbon dioxide at all and are cheaper than burning fossil fuels uh and therefore uh as we look at now future capacity creation in to meet future demand growth for power it will all come from renewable energy in most cases and therefore as we look to build more it will all be cleaner and so therefore and over time 10 20 years later it will start replacing more directly the legacy systems that we have as well and as that happens um, you will find obviously that the whole power sector starts getting cleaned up and so in some ways i would describe this as the decarbonizing or the decarbonization of the electricity sector so that is the first thing that is happening as a result of this um, uh, evolution of technology uh, by the virtue of wind and solar and now storage becoming much cheaper than coal based power the second thing that is also happening is that even though electricity represents only a quarter of the overall energy mix the reality is that electricity as a provider of energy more broadly that percentage is likely to go up through the development of things like electric vehicles uh and eventually through the emergence of things like green hydrogen and those fundamentally are going to allow the penetration of electricity within the overall energy mix to go up from the current one quarter to as high as three quarters in the next 30 years or thereabouts and so there is going to be a further electrification of the energy system as well so therefore there are two fundamental transitions in energy that are taking place right now number one is the uh decarbonization of electricity and number 2 is the deepening of electrification within the energy mix and both of these eventually if you have electricity accounting for 70% or 75% of all energy production and that is produced almost entirely from clean sources then you almost solve 70% of your carbon emissions problem right so i think that is therefore step one of what needs to happen and as i said technology solutions are there commercial solutions are there that give us the hope that all of this is going to be achievable now there is of course the balance 25 30% that will be left over at that time and that will continue if there are there aren't solutions found for those use cases then we will need to have certain the emergence of new technologies around carbon capture and storage because net zero by any date does not imply that we will stop emitting carbon it means that we will continue to emit carbon we will have a way potentially to capture that carbon and store it and we will also have potentially the creation of carbon sinks through things like uh afforestation and so on that will also need to emerge and so therefore there will continue to be some carbon emissions happening but it will reduce substantially from where we are right now and it will also mean 
carbon getting sucked out of the atmosphere through carbon capture directly as well as through natural mechanisms so i think that is the way i see us heading towards a net zero by 2050 2060 kind of a time frame now the question is is this doable are we on the right track at this point of time or not and are we going to be able to do it fast enough to prevent this 2 degree centigrade temperature change from happening now this is really where the matter gets a little bit complicated um so while the path the pathway is now uh, sort of showing up the question is whether we can get onto that pathway and move on it fast enough to bend the trajectory rapidly enough to make sure that we do not emit carbon to the extent that we cross the 2000 gigatons of carbon dioxide that we cannot cross uh, into the atmosphere and today we're already at uh, about 1300 1400 and emitting at the rate of almost 50 60 Uh, gigatons every year and within 20 years you would have crossed that 2000 gigatons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere level um, and so this is really where we need to put in a lot of effort we need to put in effort fundamentally to bend the trajectory downwards as rapidly as possible and while technology solutions are available uh, and they are available at commercially attractive levels we need to basically make sure that the, the you know that from a policy standpoint the implementation is as rapid as possible now that is really where cop 20 you know cop the the 26 and all the other cops that will come after that become so critical because they ultimately are the only forum where multilateral conversations happen now let me sort of deep dive into india and look at the india situation um now i think we be actually been quite fortunate that uh, over the last 15 years or so india has been nurturing its renewable energy industry uh we started with wind about 10 years ago we started also with solar and about 3 years ago both wind and solar became substantially cheaper than coal based power and we also have found ways uh, to now supply combinations of wind and solar and storage which are able to give almost base load power which is almost at prices which are 25 to 30% cheaper than coal based power now in that scenario there is absolutely no case any longer for anybody to be adding any more coal based power and frankly we're not seeing any more additions of coal based power and no no investor also wants to invest in them any, anymore so now the question is india's power demand is going to grow at about 6 or 7% a year um all the 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 the, the huge target that the government of india has set of 500 giga gigawatts of renewable energy by 2030 will fundamentally be needed to just meet the demand growth and it's going to be a stretch to get to that number because it requires a lot of on ground uh activities and it requires execution it requires equipment a whole bunch of things we need to develop a domestic manufacturing industry we need all the capital to come in so there are quite a few constraining factors um uh, but all of that needs to get addressed and as it only gets addressed are we going to hit that 500 gigawatt target and then we can start looking at replacing the existing capacities of coal with renewable energy the other interesting thing that is happening now is the emergence of green hydrogen which i alluded to earlier now why is green hydrogen so critical is because green hydrogen by replacing gray hydrogen in areas where hydrogen is used as a feedstock in the refining industry in the fertilizer industry and so on um can actually prevent the emissions of carbon dioxide in the production of green hydrogen or hydrogen itself which is quite substantial and secondly uh it can through things like fuel cells and so on also address some part of the mobility sector and so therefore the hard to abate sectors which are the steel cement refining and so on can to a reasonable extent be addressed by hydrogen uh, hydrogen may also emerge as a potential fuel for both civil aviation and for the maritime sector and so hydrogen has this unique opportunity and capability of providing the bridge and really allowing electricity to become a much bigger part of the overall energy mix now how because of the cost of making green hydrogen 70% of that cost is renewable energy because fundamentally you make green hydrogen by electrolyzing water for which you need to have huge amounts of electricity which go through water and create the green hydrogen and emit actually oxygen and so therefore that's it's actually very positive for the environment uh, activity so i think you'll see green hydrogen becoming a much more important thing going forward now if you think about it india as a country imports about 150 billion dollars worth of fossil fuels every year left unchecked that number will grow to 300 billion dollars over the next 5 or 7 years and this is really where we need to have renewable energy and green hydrogen kick in to reduce india's dependence 
not only will it reduce India's dependence, but if we start generating more and more of our energy through cleaner sources, it will also address in very fundamental ways the whole pollution problem that we are suffering from right now. And so therefore, these are going to be very important aspects of providing the solutioning to helping us become a carbon-free uh, or you know, much less carbon intensive economy over the next 10 years. And I think the Indian government recognizes that and therefore is pushing so hard to make sure that green hydrogen becomes a reality, that wind and solar are able to move forward much faster. But there are several infrastructural bottlenecks that have to be overcome. And now I, I'm sort of going from the macro all the way to the micro. The reality is to implement all these projects, you need transmission infrastructure, which fortunately the government is building out. You need uh, equipment, we can't keep importing everything from China. And so therefore we need a, the creation of a domestic solar manufacturing industry and eventually batteries as well. And you need a healthy uh, electricity sector in general, which is getting impacted very significantly because we have distribution companies which are owned by state governments of India. And state governments of India, unfortunately, tend to use distribution utilities as ATMs to provide you know, free power to people and then not essentially uh, put in their budgetary allocation or subsidies into those entities. And so therefore, these distribution utilities are unfortunately working suboptimally. Not enough investment in going, is going into building the front end, the consumer facing end of the power sector. And unless that part of the whole equation is resolved, it is always going to be hamstringing India's development of a decarbonized pathway going forward, because that is really the fundamental part of the value chain that meets the customers. So we really need to address that. Corporates now, by the way, are finding more and more uh, uh, you know, reasons now to shift towards renewables because there's pressure from them from an ESG standpoint. There's a cost benefit that they get. And so all of that is making them become much bigger part uh, you know, are sort of coming to us much more to find solutions. Now, we as a company, by the way, have pioneered the evolution of this round-the-clock power uh, sort of uh, projects using renewable energy, uh, where we're combining, as I said earlier, wind and solar and storage to provide almost baseload solutions for the power sector. So that is something that we've pioneered and that is likely to become a mainstay of the electricity sector going forward. We, uh, as Apanna was saying earlier, generate almost 10,000 megawatts of power now. Uh, which is more than about one and a half percent of India's electricity production. Um, we have also we also help mitigate in doing that about half a percent of India's carbon emissions. So as a company, we have beginning to have impact in within the country as a whole. Now we need many more companies like us. We need more more and more people to come in and really put our shoulder to the wheel to address the problem of how to decarbonize India and essentially improve the air quality problem. And the good news is that there are more companies coming in. I think the oil and gas companies have recognized that energy, the kind of energy that they were doing earlier, will get phased out in the next 10 to 20 years. And therefore, they'd better start moving towards the cleaner sources of energy. So that's something that has begun to happen. So I think uh, the, some of the incumbent utilities are beginning to move from thermal into renewables as well. So I think as all of that happens, we'll see more and more capital coming in. Additionally, I would say that the world now recognizes that India is a terrific, terrific opportunity uh, for this energy transition. And therefore, there is a tremendous amount of investor interest also in investing in India. And therefore, I don't think that there's going to be any dearth of capital. Really, what we need is the improvement in the distribution utility sector. We need enlightened policymaking because this is policymaking in an environment where technology is changing rapidly and there is a massive transition underway. Policymakers need to be on top of those changes. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes we have a two step forward, one step backwards approach. It has to be only three steps forward and no steps backward. So I think we need much more effective uh, policy making, not just, and I'm not just talking about India, I'm talking about globally. You know, you can't have situations where the US president changes and suddenly the US is out of uh, global treaties and so on. Uh, all of that just sets the whole conversation around climate change back by decades almost. Uh, and that there is only so much that the commercial side can push. We need governments to really be you know playing along as well because we need a full aligned effort to be happening here uh, for this change to happen so there are quite a few rays of hope i think which i've talked about uh, there are uh, problems as well but beyond everything else is a massive urgency that we need to make all of these actions happen incredibly rapidly because if we don't um, we will essentially have this problem of climate change coming and hitting us even more harder in the face than it is already doing right now. 
and the whole issue of air pollution, which is sort of in some ways related, will also continue to fester and will continue to become, you know, keep uh, being a problem. So solutions are there. We just need to find ways of now getting them out there much, much faster. So I am an optimist by nature. I would still be optimistic that uh, we will be able to find solutions. And uh, certainly we as a company, our company, Renew Power, we intend to be a very central part of that uh, solutioning. And there are many, many different models now that we are working on to address not just the core of it, but you know the broader ecosystem of this problem. Uh, so I think you'll see many more companies and capital coming into it. And I think therefore, as I said earlier, that gives me cause for hope and optimism that between th those efforts and between conferences like this, uh, there is enough momentum in civil society to now push forward and try to find solutions really rapidly. So let's hope that this problem therefore starts getting addressed in right earnest much more seriously now going forward. Thank you so much for inviting me for this uh, keynote session. And Aparna, back to you. Yeah, um, many, thank many thanks, Suman. That was very enriching and enlightening conversation you've had. You've thrown light of almost what uh, is, I mean, uh, you know, what, what, what kind of um, solutions are required from multiple stakeholders. And uh, it is also uh, nice to know that the government is on track and we really hope that um, the solutions come faster and we do accelerate uh, to uh, more cleaner, greener means of energy, and we uh, accelerate to just transition, uh, race to zero, and race to re resilience faster. Um, thank you so much uh, uh, for um, uh, thank you so much for this. And uh, John, over to you. I would um, uh, want to, want you to come on screen now and introduce Harry and Shamika to uh, for their concluding remarks uh, for today. Hello, everyone. My name is John Koshi, and I work in the capacity of Chief of Staff to Dr. Shashito, a member of Parliament, alongside my responsibilities with Air Quality Asia, uh, where I work in the capacity of India Parliamentary Project Consultant. Um, we are now at the end of two eventful days of high-level deliberations on various aspects of India's air quality crisis, a conversation that has brought um, at this very round table senior voices from government, uh, Parliament, civil society, and academia all united in a common commitment to address India's critical crisis of air quality. For our concluding session, let me take this opportunity to invite Honorable Harry Dunwoven, Secretary and Board Member of Air Quality Asia, to address this gathering. Beside his considerable experience in driving the air quality conversation, Honorable Dunwoven has also served as a Member of Parliament for 18 years a career that also saw him rise to key positions within the government of New Zealand, including the Minister for Transport Safety. Following Honorable Dunovan's address, may I then request Professor Shamika Ravi, Vice President at the Observer Research Foundation and non-resident senior fellow at the Governance Studies Program at the Brookings Institution, Washington, DC, to address and conclude our deliberations at the fifth edition of the Roundtable. Honorable Dunovan, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, John. Excellencies, honourable members of parliament, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Kia ora tato, that's good evening to everyone from New Zealand. After serving for 18 years in the New Zealand parliament, the final six of those as Associate Minister of Energy and also Minister for Transport Safety, I was privileged to be invited to join the board as the Secretary of Air Quality Asia. Through all of my career, I've had a strong interest in the vital topics which we have heard discussed over the last two days. And can I say how informative and interesting I've found that. Thanks to Mr. Sumant Sina, CEO of Renew Power, for his optimism and for his comprehensive analysis, and particularly his comments on green hydrogen, which I'll come back to in a moment. On behalf of Air Quality Asia, I want to thank both all of the speakers and the audience for joining us at the annual roundtable consultations, the fifth in a series initiated by AQA board member, Honourable Dr. Shashi Tharoor, MP, India, which started on 24th of July, 2017. Through this series, we want to bring together the parliamentarians, the civil society stakeholders, the technical experts, communication professionals and health professionals to share best practices and latest available data so that we ensure that future generations in India and around the world can live healthy lives in a healthy environment. We want to give special thanks to Honourable 
Nitin Gadkari, Honourable Minister for Road Transport and Highways, my AQA colleagues, Board Member on Honourable Dr Shashi Tharoor MP, AQA Senior Advisor and Member, National Energy Council Indonesia, the Honourable Satya Widya Yuda, AQA Treasurer MJ Nolan, Ireland, and the distinguished members of the Parliament of India, as well as members of the Legislative Assemblies. AQA thanks the Observer Research Foundation, who have collaborated with us since the 2018 Roundtable 2, with special thanks to Mr. Sanjoy Joshi, Chairman, Mr. Samir Saran, President, ORF, and the team at ORF for their work in bringing this event to fruition. I want to thank our experts from NIPFP, TERI, Shaker Innovation, World Resources Institute, Institute of Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, CEW, Ola Mobility Institute, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, the Rocky Mountain Institute of India, the Centre for Economy and Growth, and the Centre for Science and Environment, all for sharing their knowledge and their assistance. Finally, I want to thank all the donors of AQA and ORF with whose support we're able to bring expertise and best practices together with policymaking. Now, this event would not have been possible without the tireless work of AQA President, Ms. Shazia Rafi, and the AQA dedicated team, John Koshi and Dorata piotrowska pelka We've heard today of many initiatives, programs and innovations taking place in India currently and planned for the near future. New ideas and technologies are being developed and trialled all around the world. Just as an example, the trucking and engineering and energy industries in my home province here in New Zealand are currently engaged in a major green hydrogen heavy vehicle project. My own city council is currently building a major sludge drying plant at our sewage treatment stations, jointly powered by hydrogen. Three years ago, I was fortunate to visit Portugal and was very impressed with the use of hydrogen as a catalyst for improving the output efficiency and significantly lowering the emissions of existing conventional diesel vehicles. Portugal was also putting a great deal of effort into solar generation of hydrogen. So like in India, it is encouraging that there are great minds working hard all around the world to solve our future energy needs. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I wish you all a very good evening and a cleaner energy future. There is still much to do. Po day. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much, Honorable Harry uh, Dunhoven. May I invite Professor Shamika Ravi now to join us and address the gathering? Thank you, John. Well, very happy to be here and congratulations to uh, the organizers. Uh, I come in from uh, an economic perspective and uh, much more from a political economy perspective of this problem. Uh, a little bit of what we are witnessing in the Indian context vis-a-vis uh, -vis policymaking for pollution has to do with the problem of the commons. Uh, over years, the problem has aggravated. It is very well documented now. However, each state is struggling uh, with these problems on their own. There is a complex layer of political economy given uh, the various state policies. And given the fact that there are very strong negative externalities from policies of one state which are affecting the other, uh, I would like to uh, introduce you to some of the studies that we have done, uh, just looking at the kind of uh, economic damage that air pollution in India has, has uh, wrecked over the last several years. In fact, we have a global burden of disease a study for 2019, uh, which comprehensively looks at health and economic impact of air pollution for every state in the country. In fact, we estimate that approximately 18% of all deaths in India are attributable to air pollution. The deaths from household air pollution, which is a part of this, has actually fallen thanks to progressive policies uh, by which uh, households have moved away from fossil fuels, wood, etc. In fact, the expansion of the LPG scheme 
is a very large part of the success story. So that's a good part of the transition that we have seen in terms of policies, um, uh, encouraging clean energy utilization and households actively participating in this. And this is across all states of India. But the death from ambient uh, particulate matter pollution has actually increased more than 115% in the last 20 years. And this is a great cause of concern and a large part of the uh, problem of the comments that I was referring to earlier. The death from ambient ozone pollution has actually increased by nearly 140%. This is no mean feat. This is a, this is a very large uh, jump. And we estimate that the total loss to India's GDP is close to 1.36%, which is a very significant uh, part of, uh, of GDP for an emerging market, uh, for an aspirational low middle income country, which still has about 7% absolute poverty. So I think uh, the driving forces are, uh, are numerous. Uh, and while uh, there is an effort uh, to make the energy transition at uh, the central level uh, from the central government, the union government, uh, we still have uh, to tackle uh, the various different components of uh, air pollution. And in that respect, it is very nice to see this collaboration, uh, uh, collaborative project uh, between our institutions. And I'm, uh, I'm greatly appreciative and I hope to contribute in any way that we can. Now, some part of uh, uh, telling these stories in terms of driving policy uh, making also requires us to document what these losses look like beyond certain macro numbers. Uh, so there are actually a series of studies that we publish looking at what air pollution is doing to cardiovascular health. What is it doing to hypertension? What is it doing to blood pressure? And these are very well articulated uh, because these are estimated at highly localized level. Uh, and we do see that states where you have the maximum amount of uh, uh, biomass you know, uh, pollution, which is mostly coming from the crop burning, et cetera, houses in closest proximity are the worst affected. In fact, they have a very high likelihood of uh, uh, high BP and, uh, and various different uh, cardiovascular health. So part of policy making, I think part of our effort as researchers, scholar community is to translate what we find in research to make it uh, accessible to policymakers and public at large, and of course the media as well, so that we sensitize uh, all parties in terms of uh, the nature of the beast, so that collectively uh, we can think of uh, various different solutions. I think the time is right in terms of uh, there being a policy objective on overall aspiration that the country has to lead the global energy transition. But a lot of these micro stories that we are putting together and the various estimates of the true cost uh, in terms of uh, lives as well as economic uh, cost of pollution. I think this goes a long way uh, into understanding and trying uh, to uh, promote the right policies uh, across countries. So with that, I, I thank you for your time and, and I wish you all my very best.